So the first lecture for <clears throat> Physical Wellbeing 2 ES102 is going to deal with, with body weight and, and weight management. And we're not just going to talk about managing weight uh, on the high end, but also managing your weight from being too low. And so we're going to address both overweight and underweight. But before we can do that, I, I want to take just a moment to define healthy body weight. And I really want to put some numbers to healthy body weight. So healthy body weight is going to be one way defined through body mass index or the BMI. If your body mass index is between 19 and 25, so a BMI of 19 and 25, you're considered to be at a, uh, a normal body weight or a healthy body weight. If you are above 25, so 25 plus, you're considered to be overweight. And if you get uh, above 30 or more, this is where we begin to, to typically define that overweightness as obesity. On the other side of the scale is going to be underweight, which is going to be less than 19. So BMI or body mass index of less than 19 means that you are underweight. And this body mass index is a simple ratio between your height and your, your mass. And so we use this equation to, to calculate these numbers. So first, to, to start out, we're going to deal with the underweight, and then we'll deal with the overweight. We'll deal with some issues between the, the two different conditions. So starting out with overweight. Uh, currently in the United States, it's estimated that 60% of the population is overweight, and of that, 30% of the total population would be obese. So these 30% are included in this 60%. Don't read this as being 90% are overweight or, over, or obese. 60% is overweight, and then half of that 60% or 30% are considered obese. So 60% overweight, and then the 30% obese excessive accumulation of body mass. Now, most of you have probably been told that obesity and overweightness is a U.S. problem. And this is no longer really an accurate statement. In fact, it really has never been an accurate statement. But it's even less accurate than it was uh, even 10 years ago. The U.S. at one time was one of the leading um, countries in the world for overweight and obesity. And we're now no longer number one in our overweight and obese statistics. Uh, and the image that I have illustrating, uh, illustrated here on the, on the screen is actually obesity data for the 188 defined geographic countries in the world right now. Uh, and what you can see is the rates of obesity exceed in, in some countries are, are in, in excess of 80 and 90 percent of the population either being o overweight or obese. And as you move along in this direction, and then as you move down, we are seeing the, the countries that have lower and lower levels of obesity. So North, North Korea is, is the um, lowest prevalence of overweight and obesity. It's about 5 percent of their total population. Uh, the United States is right here. This is 27th on the list. And I'm showing you this picture not to brag on the United States or anything like that because it's still a major problem here in the United States. But I'm, I'm using this to illustrate that obesity and overweightness is a global problem. And really, this is not a problem that is uh, specific to any culture or region or group of countries. If you look through the countries here, there are countries from the Middle East, there are countries from Africa, there are countries from North America, there are countries from South America, and there are countries from Europe here in the, uh, in the uh, upper portions of this figure. So this is a, a problem that is uh, uh, 
quickly becoming epidemic in many, many parts of the uh, of the world, even in, in places that we think of as typically being areas of deficient in calories and, and uh, problems with hunger, uh, places that we would define as the third world are, are beginning to see higher rates of obesity. So again, right now, uh, the United States <clears throat> is at uh, 27th on the list of 188. 188, so 27th out of 188 countries. So this idea of higher levels of, of body mass, uh, overweightness and obesity, um, just like we did with, with healthy body weight, BMI between 19 and 20, individuals who are classified as being overweight these individuals are going to be associated with greater than normal rates of mortality. But there is going to be one caveat here. So associated with greater than normal rates of mortality, meaning that they are dying from all different types of disease conditions at a higher, more frequent rate than a normal weight individual. So individuals who are overweight associated with a greater than higher or greater than normal rate of mortality. But that one caveat is that these individuals typically have to be physically inactive for that higher rate of mortality to be observed. In other words, without a change in body mass, but a change in physical activity, we have a decrease in this rate of mortality. But none the same, most individuals who fall into this category of being overweight are also highly phys uh, physically inactive. And as you move up this scale of uh, inactivity, or I'm sorry, of body weight from an active individual to a, a more inactive individual, the more body weight that you have, the more likely you are um, to have a higher rate of mortality. So for an individual who's overweight, you're looking at a 10% a uh, increase over what is recommended for normal body weight for that individual based off of their height. So you are classified as being overweight if you have a body weight that's 10% over the recommended normal. And in terms of body mass index, we typically define an individual as being uh, overweight um, in general terms, just simply saying BMI over 25, which is also going to now include the obese individuals if we categorize it more strata, uh, with more strata, uh, more uh, layers of information, and just say overweight and then obese and uh, morbidly obese, the overweight individual is 25 to 29.9 .9 BMI. So as you move past that 29.9 .9 BMI, you move into this stage called obesity. Obesity can also be defined as an individual being severely overweight and most of this extra weight is carried around as excessive body fat. In terms of quantity, uh, we're now looking at a 20% plus um, increase over what is recommended for a normal body weight. And in terms of BMI, uh, we're looking at a BMI for most individuals that exceeds 30, per, uh, a BMI of 30. So I've already mentioned that if you're overweight and obese with lower levels of physical activity, you have higher rates of, of health issues or you have uh, a greater risk for certain health maladies. Uh, and, and some of those health issues can become very problematic, very chronic type diseases. Uh, but it's very important to just remember 
that this is when we couple the obesity or the overweightness with low activity levels. In other words, what I'm saying is it's better to be an overweight individual or an obese individual who is active than an in, uh, individual who is physically inactive at any body weight. I would rather be active, obese individual than a normal weight, um, inactive individual. And so the health issues that begin to increase in prevalence and increase in effect as you become more and more physically inactive and you increase additional body weight, um, things like type 2 diabetes, you have a 33% rise uh, in type 2 diabetes if you are overweight, obese, and, and in this inactive category. So type 2 diabetes. Uh, contributing to about 400,000 deaths here in the United States per annual basis. So these are individuals who are passing away due to a variety of different disease conditions in a premature state uh, due to this higher level of body fat coupled with the low levels of physical inactivity. So really it's important not only to be physically active, very important to be physically active, but it's also good if we can begin to uh, reduce our obesity and our overweightness. But it's really not as simple as one may think. Uh, so when we look at the human body, you have food that is consumed that carries a quantity, a, qual, a quality called energy. And then when you move and are physically active, you utilize that energy to help support muscle uh, and, and bone function, to help support uh, all of the different physiological functions. And this idea is uh, known as energy balance. Energy balance is this idea that uh, the energy that comes in, this is again, NRG is my abbreviation for energy. So the energy that, in, that comes in is balanced to that energy that goes out. What you consume versus what you utilize due to your basal metabolic rate, your physical activity, etc. So if it's in balance, if energy in, 2,000 calories in, is balanced to 2,000 calories utilized on a daily basis, you would expect, just through logic here, that we may have weight maintenance. But I'm going to put a question mark there. And the reason I'm going to put a question mark there is because what if we shift the balance? What if we increase energy that comes in? So we have a higher caloric intake, or we decrease the energy that goes out, so we're not as uh, physically active. Does this result in weight gain? And then we can also ask the converse. If we decrease the energy that comes in or increase the energy that goes out, does that mean that we now are going to be in a state of weight loss? Now, logically, it makes a lot of sense that if you balance energy in to balance to energy out, if that equation is balanced, that you're going to be in a state of weight management. This figure here kind of details um, this relationship and what logically makes sense. So if you increase the amount of calories that you're taking in or decrease the amount that you're using, then you should see weight gain, right? Well, this is maybe a little bit too simple of a, of a model. Um, the, the idea here for weight management would be that if this is a true balanced relationship, if we adjust one's energy balance that we should be able to see changes in body mass. If we increase food consumption, increases in weight. If we increase physical activity, decreases in weight. But in reality, this idea of adjusting the energy balance is actually very difficult. 
In other words, this model of energy balance is probably far too simple. There is far more to the physiology of energy balance than just simply energy in, energy out. Uh, for one, the resting metabolic rate of an individual can be affected by a variety of different factors. So this is the amount of energy that is required to maintain your physiological systems during a 24-hour period. Uh, if you're participating in no physical activity. So you can think of this as kind of being how many how many calories am I going to burn if I just spend a 24-hour period in my bed sleeping or resting. Uh, the factors that affect this, one is, um, is your gender. So in men, it, resting metabolic rate has, to, has a tendency to be higher. If you increase muscle mass, it has a tendency to be higher. So more muscle mass, uh, increase exercise, it actually adjusts your resting metabolic rate. The converse, uh, we can have decreases in that resting metabolic rate if we are female. So women, lower levels of resting metabolic rate. Uh, if you're sedentary, And then also, uh, after you've lost weight, we have a change or a decrease in the resting metabolic rate. There is less tissue that has to be maintained, which translates into a lower caloric uh, utilization by the individual. Uh, so in addition to uh, adjusting energy balance and the, the variability that we see in metabolic rate, energy balance adjustments are also affected by physical activity, also can be affected by the calories that you consume. So there's many different factors that are going to affect your energy balance. And it's not just simply an equation of exercising more and eating less. Uh, in fact, what is probably a better model is now known as the compensatory energy balance model. And I'm going to call this an unfortunate reality. Uh, it would be a lot easier, life would be much easier if we could just say, I'm going to eat less, I'm going to exercise more, and that would induce weight loss. But what happens in reality is when we reduce our caloric intake, we have some compensation that occurs. Okay, so you go through, let's say you normally eat 2,000 calories in a day to maintain your weight, and then you reduce that by 500 calories, and you think, okay, that's going to translate uh, in a one-week period to a pound, pound and a half, maybe two pounds of, of weight loss but then it doesn't happen. And the reason it doesn't happen is because when we reduce our caloric intake, we also have this compensation that occurs. Or we have reduced utilization of other physiological functions. In other words, rather than increasing the release of energy stores from adipose tissue or from storage in skeletal muscle and, and the liver, we actually compensate by reducing the uh, energy that's utilized by a variety of other physiological systems, enzyme systems, protein uh, production, things like that. Uh, so we store or we, we preferentially keep around the storage uh, material thinking, okay, I'm in a, uh, a calorie deficient environment right now. I don't know when I'm going to have access to the higher level of calories that I'm accustomed to. So let's go ahead and reduce things like building muscle. Let's go ahead and reduce um, things like enzyme activity in my cells. And so we reduce the caloric consumption by these other physiological systems. And the net result here, even though you have reduced the number of calories that you are consuming, you have this energy balance equation that remains unaffected. 
the reduction in calories can, doesn't come from the storage, which is adding your weight, but is actually coming from reductions in the utilization of calories from these other physiological systems. So energy balance equation remains primarily unaffected. So does that mean that we can't lose weight? Well, what it may mean is that in the immediate, maybe the first two weeks or the first month, you may not have any weight loss. Weight not lost. And I'm going to underline that because that's very important to, to note that even though you've reduced your caloric consumption, maybe you've increased your physical activity, you've created this caloric... Uh, this calorie deficient uh, environment for yourself, you're not seeing this shift in your energy balance that results in reduction of weight loss. And in all reality, when we utilize just a reduction in our food intake, so reduce our caloric intake, we end up with very little change in weight and very little observable benefits to your health. In other words, for purposes of weight management, if we try to utilize diet as our main uh, weight management strategy, try to reduce our food calorie intake, we're not going to see weight loss, and we're probably not going to see very many changes to the, to the overall health of the individual. Well, how about if we increase physical activity? Okay, so with an increase in physical activity, we actually still have that same compensation that occurs. So this is, so to speak, manipulating the other side, the energy outside of this equation. And we still have um, that, that compensation for the lower number of calories, we, we're putting ourselves into this calorie deficient environment as we utilize uh, physical activity to reduce um, uh, our, our calories or to shift uh, the energy balance towards, towards weight loss. Compensation in those other physiological systems still occurs. And the net result here, again, is very little uh, weight loss. So there's very little weight loss uh, in this scenario as well. So what do, we, what do we do? Well, what we need to start out with here, the key is to understand that with increase in physical activity, unlike a decrease in caloric intake, we actually see a vast improvement in parameters of health. Reductions in blood pressure, reductions in cal uh, um, uh, triglycerides and cholesterol levels, improvements in immune function, which results in disease resistance, reductions in risk for cancer, diabetes, uh, and other chronic diseases. So rather than focusing on weight loss, And when it doesn't happen, getting frustrated that it has not happened, we need to begin in this, at least this initial period of, of trying to manage weight at the vast improvements that we can observe with health. So kind of the big take-home message here. What's the big take-home message from the first part of this lecture? And really, the, the take-home message is that if you're trying to lose weight, you need to refocus. And you need to refocus on accumulation of physical activity. Rather than the loss of weight. So this idea of increasing physical activity weight loss in the initial phase is going to be very limited. 
most people get very, very frustrated because two months out, they may weigh a li even a little bit more than when they started their diet and exercise plan. Uh, and, and we have a tendency to get that frustration um, and, and let it have control. And we say, well, I'm done with this. I'm not, I'm not even going to exercise anymore. I'm not going to continue. If I'm not going to lose weight, there's no reason to do this. But in reality, that exercise that they've been performing for that two months has improved their health and has improved their disease resistance capabilities. And, and those are really important things. Those are the things that lead towards improvements in quality in life. Now, does that mean you're never going to lose weight? No, absolutely not. But it's going to take a long time. And it may take years for you to begin to really see appreciable weight loss. Weight loss. Uh, but remember, you have the accumulation of health benefits because of your higher level of physical activity that's going to improve your quality of life, even your quantity of life. You live longer even if you remain uh, overweight or obese. So the idea here with, with weight management, it's not as simple as just energy in, energy out because of the compensatory systems that are, that are occurring inside of the organism, but the physical activity or the increase in physical activity becomes uh, paramount to be able to improve the health of the, of the individual. And we should refocus on the accumulation of physical activity, understanding that there are those underlying sometimes seemingly intangibles that are occurring. Decreases in blood pressure, increases in your immune function, decreases in triglycerides, decreases in cholesterol levels, resistance to, to disease. Uh, so with kind of that first section on, on body weight, we were dealing with overweight, uh, obesity, how do we begin to look at uh, uh, physical activity and diet as being inducers of, of weight loss. What are some of the things that are going on there? Um, the other side of the coin is going to be this idea of, of underweight. So you're at this BMI now of, of 19 and below, or below 19, and, and you're underweight. And this can actually be very unhealthy as well. Uh, it's very important for an individual who's of normal weight to maintain that normal weight and not to move into this underweight category. Now one of the reasons that being underweight is um, potentially hazardous to your health is because frequently it's related to serious conditions or serious um, uh, problems with an individual's body image. Body image is this idea that we have a mental representation of our own body. So this mental representation, you look in the mirror and you see your body or your image of your body um, in, in your own terms. And we can either have a positive image which means the individual looks in the mirror and says, you know what, I'm okay. I'm okay with my body's characteristics. And for the most part, these individuals really don't have much to worry about. But we can also have a negative body image. And this negative body image, you look in the mirror and you think, oh man, I am not okay with this. And in all reality, this negative body image is actually going to be affected uh, by a variety of different factors. So your body image, whether it's positive or negative, is affected by several factors. Uh, I got a, uh, a, an image here, and what you're looking at is a, a figure that illustrates the body mass index of um, pageant winners. So these are Miss America pageant winners. And what you can see from 1920 to pretty close to the present day, there has been this downward trend in uh, the size or the body mass index of um, Miss America pageant winners. Uh, remember 19, which is right here. This uh, is kind of your normal, bottom of your normal range. And you can see that pretty much 50% and they're almost all within the last 40 years 
of pageant winners are significantly below that uh, normal body weight. And so they actually would be classified as being underweight. Now, images like this and, and, and things like this that are presented uh, by the media, there are expectations um, from culture and, and from cultural memes that influence how we view our own bodies or how we should view our own bodies and how we are also nurtured or how we are brought up. You could have been brought up in a home that wasn't concerned about body weight and so you may have lots of relatives who are, are obese or overweight and there are health problems associated with that or you may have grown up in a home where you were constantly told that you were too fat or that you were too big and so you may have these negative images of yourself even if you're a normal body weight. And so these factors that affect uh, the way that we view our own body through media and cultural memes and the way that we are raised up have um, created or have caused a variety of different uh, uh, image, body image disorders. And I want to just talk uh, real quick about, about two of them. Uh, these would be classified as being the most severe forms of, of negative body image. Okay, so severe negative body images. And our two that I would like to um, introduce you to today, they are uh, body dysmorphic disorder so body dysmorphic disorder uh, or um, sometimes abbreviated as being BDD. The other one, we'll get to it in just a second, is going to be muscle dysmorphia. Uh, but this, this body dysmis, dysmorphic disorder or BDD, uh, these individuals, when they view themselves in the mirror, they, they see a, a very uh, different image than is actually there. Uh, individuals can be excessively skinny and still, still view themselves as being overweight or being fat. And they have a tendency to exhibit ex, uh, ex, uh, excessive compulsive, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. There we go. Obsessive compulsive disorder when it comes to trying to lose weight or trying to maintain their weight. And that ex, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder can lead towards some um, very poor decisions in, in body weight management. So we do classically define the body dysmorphic disorder as being a type of obsessive compulsive disorder. This condition can actually cause in the individual uh, things like depression, social phobias, and, and even can lead towards uh, suicide. So depression, social phobias, and suicide. The other disorder is muscle dys, uh, dysmorphia. And muscle dysmorphia is a severe negative body image in which the individual distorts their body image. They, they, they see themselves as being very small and underdeveloped despite most of these individuals being uh, very muscle-bound individuals. So this is an inaccurate perception So an inaccurate perception that an individual has about themselves that they think they are small and underdeveloped. For both of these conditions, muscle dysmorphia and uh, body dysmorphic disorder, these are medically emergent conditions. 
And so we encourage these individuals to seek medical attention. Now alongside the body image issues and, and the body image um, concerns, a lot of times these are associated with eating disorders. Uh, although eating disorders, uh, quite frankly, can also occur separate from uh, any sort of negative uh, body image. Um, in addition to eating disorders, there's also a class of, of conditions known as disordered eating. Okay, so these are two separate conditions, eating disorders versus disordered eating. Uh, both of these types of conditions, and you're going to recognize um, several of these, they result in, in disturbances in, in eating patterns or behaviors. So eating patterns and behaviors are, are disrupted. Um, oftentimes these individuals suffering from eating disorders and disordered eating are associated with negative body images. And there's this overarching fear of excessive body fat accumulation, concerns about excessive body fat or weight. So we kind of fear body fat and weight excessively. And as we just wrap up this first lecture, I want to hit on uh, three different types, uh, two different eating disorders and one uh, uh, disordered eating. The, the eating disorders are anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa, anorexia and, and bulimia. And then the disordered eating is a condition known as binge eating. So we'll start out with anorexia. And anorexia nervosa is uh, a refusal to maintain body weight. So this refusal to maintain body weight, uh, it's also associated with what's uh, defined as an intense fear of becoming fat. This intense fear of becoming fat um, may be illogical. Uh, it may be a small amount of weight gain, which is potentially even healthy. And they say, I'm gaining too much weight, I'm becoming fat. Uh, it's estimated that in the United States, we're looking at about 1 to 3 million Americans who are uh, affected by anorexia. And it's about 95% of this 1 to 3 million population who are female. Now, the biggest issue with anorexia nervosa is it, the, the decisions that are made here on consumption patterns and exercise, and a lot of times it's excessive exercise, can actually lead to severe medical complications. severe medical complications. The second eating disorder I want to hit on here is bulimia or bulimia nervosa. And bulimia nervosa is uh, exemplified through 
what's known as binge eating, where you consume large quantities of calories and then you purge or you get rid of this excessive uh, con consumption of salary. You try to compensate. Uh, so in other words, you overeat and then you compensate somehow. Overeating is just an excessive consumption of calories. The compensation, uh, most frequently, it comes from induced vomiting uh, and then excessive exercise. This cycle of consuming large quantities of calories and then getting rid of them either with vomiting or uh, a combination of vomiting and excessive exercise is uh, very physically stressful on the body and can lead towards uh, medically emergent medically emergent stress and medically emergent um, conditions. All right. Um, the one disordered eating example I want to hit on is called binge eating. And this is a disrupted pattern of eating. And most of the time, a binge eater has some sort of trigger. And it could be stress, it could be relationship issues, it could be uh, a variety of, of different things. But there's a trigger to consume large quantities of food. And as we consume these large quantities of food, it's large amounts of calories that come in all at one time. Uh, again, this can be very, very difficult for the body to, um, to be able to handle. Uh, all three of these conditions, and there are other conditions as well that I'm not going to have time to hit on, they all are going to require medical attention. And this medical attention may require both physical treatment for the condition, dealing with the disrepair of the body, and then also men mental or psychological treatment or intervention to help manage uh, the perceptual issues. All right, so that's all I got here today for um, the, the weight management and the body weight section, chapter nine. Um, just a real quick uh, reminder here. Due on January 27th, so January 27th, 2016, at 12 p.m. by noon, I'm going to need the first three labs. We're going to dip back into Chapter 8, and we're going to pull Lab 8.2. And then I also want you to complete Labs 9.1 and 9.2. Uh, I'm sorry, 9.1 and 9.3, rather, not 2. So 9.1 and 9.3. Uh, and you can bring those to me on or before the 27th at noon in Miller 205. All right, hope you have a great day, uh, and I look forward to seeing you soon.